may be obese, she may be thin, but she may be still a PCOS. And uh, more than that, she may be having irregular periods and be a PCOS, or she may be having regular periods and yet be a PCOS. So here on the other side of the spectrum, we have a woman or a girl who is also having irregular periods, but she is having a premature ovarian insufficiency. So that is the other hormonal problem, which is emerging now as one of the most worrisome and difficult problems to treat today in the country amongst all women. Hello, friends, and greetings from VLCC, and a very good evening to all of you. I'm Dr. Anju Kay, Vice President and Head Preventive Healthcare at VLCC, your host for the session today. And with me are going to be, uh, with me are co-panelists, Dr. Sonia Malik, India's leading gynecologist and obstetrician. She'll be here with us soon. And eminent cardiologist, Dr. Dheeraj Bhatia, and nutrition expert, Dr. Deepti Verma, and each of whom you will meet shortly. So let's talk about VLCC. VLCC with 310 locations in 143 cities across 12 countries. Uh, they, we are in South Asia, Southeast Asia, GCC region, and East Africa. And we are, of course, the leader in beauty and wellness arena. Um, in fact, our uh, program, wellness program, is recommended by IMA, the Indian Medical Association. So this, uh, this webinar, this monthly webinar is part of our series uh, of educational contribution. Uh, this is for holistic wellness through quality information and healthy lifestyle choices. Yes, so the 8th of this month was International Women's Day and that's what inspired us for this webinar. And this focuses on women's health especially on uh, you know, understanding the changes uh, which women experience throughout the life and what they mean, what can go wrong and what to do uh, about preventing and also managing them. Uh, these changes actually begin at puberty, a period when it is said uh, that boys begin to notice girls and who notice boys. And yes, girls' bodies actually begin to show visible changes of maturation earlier than uh, boys' bodies do. So on a lighter note, let me share the five stages in women's life, which everyone will relate to. So the first one is to grow up. The second one is to fill out. Third is to slim down. And the fourth is to hold it in. And the final stage is to hell with it. Yes, so uh, humor aside, we formally know them as the initial growth, then adolescence, then there is uh, reproductive years, midlife, and of course the postmenopause. And through all these changes, health concerns, they are different, they vary. And they include physical, they include psychological, even mental, emotional, and physiological changes. So there are plenty of things uh, that make the female body quite remarkable. Like, you know, we are stronger uh, with our immune systems. We have better memory. We have better chances of, you know, surviving traumatic injuries. We are designed for remarkable changes during pregnancy and structurally also we are more flexible and we have better stamina you know we have better muscle endurance and however childbearing is perhaps the most fascin uh, fascinating feat you know uh, of the female body uh, and it all depends on the levels of female hormone estrogen which directly you know affects the physical changes the women experience during all the stages like adolescence, the adulthood, and the old age. And also these changes, they make them uh, prone to or susceptible to female specific or gender specific diseases and conditions which we'll be talking about. And so, you know, as you approach your forties, your body uh, will likely produce 
less and less of estrogen, the female hormone, which actually triggers your periods until you no longer menstruate. So once you have, you've had no periods for a year, that's 12 months, then you will have reached the menopause. And this is, you know, uh, sometimes a real cause of fear, worry and misconception in many women. And we must remember uh, that it's very, uh, it's very normal and natural and inevitable part of aging and understanding is the first step. And that is why we are all here. So talking about menopause, actually, uh, it occurs in three distinct stages. Uh, when we talk about menopause, so we, we have first stage, which is the perimenopause. And then we have the menopause, and then we have the postmenopause. And this perimenopause is a stage when women begins to transition and go into the menopause slowly. And it can actually start up 10 years before the, uh, the actual menopause. And you may experience symptoms like hot flushes, night sweats, vaginal dryness, etc. And these symptoms may last for several years and maybe it may cause you some discomfort. Uh, also, sometimes it is more worrisome. But during perimenopause, what is happening is your body begins to make less and less estrogen. And this continues, uh, continues until uh, your hormone levels drop suddenly. And that is, that's when you have your menopause. So it often, this perimenopause, it begins in your 40s, but some women enter perimenopause in their mid 30s, especially in India and South Asia. Uh, and after perimenopause, you reach menopause, like I said, when you have a cessation of periods for 12 months. And uh, Indian women typically reach this menopause stage at an average age of 47, almost five years earlier than the Western counterpart, which is 51 years. Of course, uh, you, if you've had your ovaries surgically removed, you will experience a sudden menopause then and there. So yes, so if, if we have to talk about menopause, the symptoms and uh, mostly, these symptoms are very mild and they pass off quickly. And for, but sometimes, you know, there is an explosion of hot flashes and mood swings. And uh, symptoms include uh, not only cessation of your periods, but also like hot flashes, night sweats, emotional changes, more mood swings, maybe trouble in sleeping, vaginal dryness. And we'll have so much more, uh, which our experts will elaborate. But uh, like I said, these symptoms, they vary greatly and sometimes they are not even noticeable. It's not that everybody is going to have all these sometimes. They just are so mild that you hardly notice them. So again, I would uh, like to highlight again uh, that uh, these changes are natural, they are normal and they will happen to every woman some sooner then others, some later. For some, they are very mild and for some, they are very severe. So let's now understand from our experts what they mean, what happens, what can happen, what to look out for, what can go wrong, and how to prevent it, how to treat it, how to manage them. Okay, so time now uh, to address your questions which you have been sending us. And I will invite our panel experts to do so. And I'm really delighted to welcome and introduce to you our first panelist for today, Dr. Dheeraj Bhatia. So Dr. Dheeraj Bhatia, as you all know, has over 35 years of clinical consultancy practice in New Delhi and has been a senior consultant cardiologist with Fortis Escorts Heart Institute and Research Center and Max Super Speciality Delhi. And he's been honored actually twice by DMA and IMA as their Doctor of Excellence of Body. 
and uh, his professional interest areas are prevention and treatment of pre-diabetes, metabolic syndrome, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, and obstructive sleep apnea. He's been actually part of the core medical research team, which had laid down guidelines for defining the management of obesity and PCOS in Asians. He's also been the senior medical advisor to VLCC for last 20 years. So let's welcome him. Good evening, Dr. Bhatia, and welcome to the webinar. And thank you so much for joining us today. Very good evening, uh, Dr. Anju, and good evening to uh, everybody who's taken out uh, precious time to be here with all of us. And uh, it's nice to be back for 15th. As you know, we keep having our, uh, as Dr. Anju said, empowerment, knowledge empowerment sessions. So, okay, Anju, let's, uh, I think, set yes, the ball that. rolling. What was the yes, first yes. question? What I can see some coming in on my phone as well. Yes, thank you, Dr. Bhatia. Yes, there are some questions. So uh, uh, let's start with the first question from our audience to do with the early menopause. So with improved opportunities uh, for education for girls and contribution to workforce, uh, we find young women delaying marriages and childbearing, which means there is a, uh, you know, now a very uh, shortening of window of time within which they can bear children. And compared to Western women, Indian women reach menopause at an average five years earlier, like I said, which alarms many young women. So here's the question for you, Dr. Bhatia, what are the most common symptoms of early and premature menopause? Right. So uh, that's something which I think, um, you know, before they say you go to management and treatment, uh, whether it is home, like somebody mentioned about fibroids just now in one of the questions, and home treatment, or whether you go for, you know, various hormonal therapies. I think the first thing is to be aware that you're going in for a problem like uh, early menopause or premature menopause. So a slight difference between the two. Premature menopause usually starts very, very early, even at the age of 35. And, um, you know, that's premature. And early starts at about 40. But premature is what is really worrying. Anyway, there's a lot of overlap in the symptoms, like we'll just narrate them. Uh, the reason is more because of decline in estrogen function. But so obviously, if your estrogen function is going to go down, you're going to have menstrual irregularities. Uh, having said that, the most important point here is uh, family history. So you'll always have a family history where the mother had gone into early menopause or premature menopause. So that's a very important uh, factor. So that almost points to this, that this is highly a genetic issue. You know, a lot of people start thinking that there are, are other causes which there are, but number one, which still holds uh, the key is the genetic. So that's a family issue, very important. And of course, uh, then as estrogen declines, you start having issues like your menstrual flow becomes less and there is a longer gap, but this is not always true. It can alternate also. It can happen that you have more uh, losses and you, your periods become you know, on, on the lesser side. Interestingly, people who have had their cycles less than 26 days for most of their life, you know, Dr. Anju, they're the ones, who, many research studies have shown that they're the ones who go into early menopause. The ones who have more than 26 days uh, cycles, they're the ones who land up with normal menopause, uh, which is you know an average of whatever, 50 years in the West, 46 years in our country, which is still five, four, five years earlier. So because the estrogen declined, you have this menstrual problem. And then you have a lot of vasomotor symptoms, like there is sweating, especially night sweats. And then they have a lot of palpitations. And then they can have you know mood changes, like you were mentioning. Uh, cognitive function declines, memory declines, irritability is there. A lot of apprehension comes into play. And uh, also another very worrying uh, factor is their night sleep. Now for all of us, night sleep is very important. And one of the things they say, what's happened to our sleep? It's just, you know, gone for a toss. And because a lot of, you know, a lot, lot of us over the years, we, we said that, okay, the greatest pointer, the greatest culprit is estrogen. Now we know that is not just estrogen. So if you don't sleep, your stress hormones are released. You're going to release cortisol, right? You're going to release insulin. 
which has its own set of problems that you become obese. And a woman's body from a pear-shaped, which means uh, more fat around the mums, uh, gluteal region, that fat starts coming around the, around the midriff. So that's why it becomes an apple-shaped body like men. So, you know, you start having that uh, central obesity. So that's all because of the insulin. And really, one of the biggest factors is that sleep. This is a problem. Then, of course, they have vaginal dryness, uh, very painful uh, because of the vaginal dryness, painful intercourse, and the sexual drive declines because of that, and of course, with the estrogens as well, and a lot of bladder problems, they get embarrassed uh, sometimes, you know, frequency is there, but then they also get embarrassed to talk about leaking bladder. So, you know, uh, there's, there's incontinence, and then, you know, and you're the expert on exercises, so I think hopefully mm -hmm. at the end of the of the talk, you tell them about what should be done because a lot sure. of women, really, they get embarrassed about this problem. And you know, Absolutely. you can't the meeting in an office, you can't keep rushing to the loo. So there, there are a lot of issues, vascular motor are there and cognitive decline is there. And then the menstrual problem is there, the hair problem is there, the weight problem is there, the sleeping pattern changes. And of course, uh, I think one major reason why we brought this up is because of uh, what we see in VLCC and that is all uh, obesity. And we see so much of weight gain and obesity. And, uh, you know, we'll come to that a little later because yes. the management part is so important because uh, that's what's going to finally lead to prevention of early menopause. We'll come to that later. Dr. Anju. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Bhatia. You're right. It's not just uh, the estrogen, who is the, which is the culprit. It is also the cortisol, like you said, the stress hormones. It can be also insulin. And of course, women are so very uh, susceptible to have a metabolic syndrome, which uh, you may talk about later, where insulin plays a very important role. And that is what leads to so many symptoms that we see even during premature menopause, right? And uh, Dr. Bhadia, osteoporosis, uh, a disease that causes bones to weaken and become brittle, uh, invariably we have seen that it affects the older women uh, and the most, uh, mostly during menopause. And it causes their bones to break more easily, especially uh, the hip, the spine and the wrist. Uh, they are very much susceptible to fractures or breaks. So Dr. Bhatia, what uh, tips would you suggest to women to prevent this and take care of their bone health preventively? Because it's so important having fractures in later life is really, really very dangerous. I think the first thing, like I was telling you about, you know, the to diagnose early menopause um, is to, you know, have predictive factors like signs and symptoms like we just discussed. Similarly for this, so here the signs and symptoms are not many. They can be, you know, body aches and one feels very low and down and easy fatigability. Fatigue is a very big factor. Easy fracture, you know, people fracture themselves very, very easy. You'll hear of a lady uh, just, you know, knocking her elbow somewhere and there it goes, snaps. Or you'll find them, you know, another problem is they, they fall on the carpet uh, because a carpet falls are notorious. And then again, there you go, boom, there's another fracture in the hip fracture. So I think a lot of easy uh, fatigability fractures, that's all. But actually, um, what is very important is the point, uh, pointer which I wanted to make. A lot of people have this, a uh, lot of physicians as well, uh, and, and the patients, they would say that, okay, we'll do a calcium. And a calcium score is fine. The percentages may be on the high side also. Same, they do another very, very important uh, element, extremely important element besides calcium, which is neglected, which is as important as magnesium. So very often they neglect the magnesium also. Now, if you do the blood test in calcium and magnesium, here is the catch. Most of it is in the bone or in the cells. So what happens is, especially magnesium. So in the blood, it will show normal. So when you do the serum, you know, calcium or the serum magnesium, which is the magnesium calcium in the blood, that test comes out normal. So you, the physician gets fooled, the patient gets fooled, says, you know, the false sense prevails that, oh, I'm fine. And you're not really fine because it's, the process has started. Maybe not osteoporosis, but the early part of osteoporosis called osteopenia. Yeah. So maybe this is osteopenia. And so one of the ways to find out, especially for calcium, is we do alkaline phosphatase. So alkaline phosphatase is a blood test, which will start rising. So early alk phos or alkaline phosphatase, please get that done, viewers. If that is high, that's the first sign that your calcium is diminishing. Now, magnesium 
is a very, very interesting element, not made by the body at all. And there is an epidemic, total epidemic. They found that almost 80% of people who have menopause have got low magnesium, especially early. And 80% and more patients with heart attacks, women included, they have low magnesium. Now, magnesium is another very difficult test to do. Very difficult. You're not going to find it easily in the, uh, you know, in the blood test. Or very, very difficult. But so magnesium, you have to go by the symptoms. So I always go by the clinical part. So you will find, you know, simple things like a patient comes in front of you and he says, "Doc, sir, you're twitching, hoti hai. Haven't we all felt that? And we say eat calcium. So wrong. It's not calcium. It's more magnesium. It's happening because these little nerve twigs here they get deposited with calcium. So that's why calcium and magnesium should be given together because magnesium negates calcium. So also they start having a lot of numbness in their fingers besides other causes of like diabetic neuropathy or they start having pins and needles in their legs. That is magnesium deficiency. Or you have jerks. You may have seen your younger brother while he's growing up. Suddenly while sleeping, even we have it. The foot goes like that. It jerks while sleeping. The jerks are called myoclonic jerks. Myoclonic jerks, they get more. Young girls who have very severe dysmenorrhea of painful menses, they're low on magnesium. People who have very severe migraine, they're low on magnesium. People who have misbeats, extra beats, a flutter, fibrillation, they are low on magnesium. People who have high blood pressure not being controlled could be low on magnesium as well. So memory, now they found that people who losing memory, like let's say at home, my mom says, I can't remember things. You know, one thing, of course, we would say is B12. We would say vitamin B12, they do, because the entire nervous system is based in B12. But the latest miracle element is magnesium. And all of us, there's a real epidemic all over the world because we are not having enough green leafy vegetables. Green leafy vegetables are full of magnesium. Many other things are. I think, Doctor, I'll leave that to Dr. Dipti. Many other things are full of magnesium. But magnesium is so important. And there's a ratio. The calcium to magnesium should be two to one. The calcium to magnesium, when we, when we give to a patient, if I just give calcium, it's not right. You should always give calcium and magnesium. So if I'm giving 1,000 calcium milligrams, I should give magnesium at least 400 milligrams. At least 400. Do you know another very interesting thing? If you're, you're low on magnesium, uh, you are going to have bad sleep. So magnesium is very, very good. And that's why they always say give magnesium at night because you're going to sleep very well. You're going to have excellent, peaceful sleep like a baby if you've taken a little bit of melatonin and, and magnesium. You can go off your tablets of Campos and Alprax which are going to play with your mind. So these people who are early menopause and in women, especially women, their bone health, I feel, is very, very poor. Very, very poor. So they definitely need to look at the alkaline phosphatase. If, you can, if that is high, get a look at your bone densitometry. If you have a family history of osteoporosis, if your mother was bent like this in her old age, and if she had a lot of aches and pains, if she was osteoporotic, please do a bone densitometry, definitely. And then, of course, <clears throat> early hormone replacement therapy, which Dr. Sonia Malik, when she comes, she'll talk about, that is good. But from our point of view, I would give magnesium supplement. I would give, I would hand them over to Dr. Dipti and say, uh, or to one of our counselors in VLCC and say, please give them a solid high magnesium diet. And I will also hand them over to Dr. Anju and say, but exercise is the best thing for bones. You have to do an exercise protocol. We have an excellent protocol and we should be spending more time doing especially cardio and a little bit of uh, toning up and little, uh, very light weights for women, which, which is you know almost like zero weights, which I think you are the best person to take. But from my side, definitely calcium, magnesium, uh, and I've told you about the symptoms, you know, the migraines, the insomnia, the dysmenorrhea, the numbness, the cardiac problem, the nerve problem, the muscle spasms. You know, you think that muscle spasm is only because of calcium. No, no, it's because of magnesium. Magnesium is probably worse. So these are the new concepts which are very important. And mind you, magnesium for all the people here who are listening, uh, our counselors and doctors, please remember that magnesium makes you lose weight. Magnesium makes you lose weight because whenever we give magnesium, magnesium, see, magnesium and calcium are opposites, like sodium and potassium. So if I welcome Dr. Sonia Malik, nice to have you on board. Such a pleasure to have you, Doctor. 
So basically, we are always, uh, when we keep giving calcium and calcium, which we've been doing over the years, the magnesium levels fall. There are 300 and, uh, plus enzyme reactions in the fat metabolism, which are dependent on magnesium. So what's going to happen? If your magnesium falls because of too much calcium, your fat metabolism is going to slow down. If that slows down, you're going to gain weight. So, and plus if your magnesium is low, you're going to be fatigued. One of the important causes is fatigue. And uh, you're going to sleep less, you're going to sleep less than more stress hormones. All this is all interconnected and all interconnected with menopause as well. So that's why I said, let me spend a few minutes talking about magnesium, very important. Great, great. So like Dr. Bhatia said, magnesium is the star uh, element, you know, because it is part of almost 300 enzymes. It, it affects your heart, it affects your brain, it affects your muscle contraction, nerve conduction, and so many things. So we must take care that we have magnesium in an appropriate quantity and also combine calcium with magnesium whenever we are taking the supplement. Uh, thank you so much for that insight, Dr. Bhatia. And Dr. Bhatia, we now hear of a new vitamin, vitamin K2. Uh, so what is it and how does it impact a woman's health? Yeah, um, that's a very good question. I know two, three people have been asking this. So uh, vitamin K2 actually is a new concept. Vitamin K1, we all know, is the vitamin which comes from green leafy vegetables and which is responsible for coagulation, right? It coagulates the proteins. K1 converts into K2. Now, we Indians and Asians have very little enzymes to convert K1 into K2. And K2 is not made naturally in the body. K2 is actually made by bacteria, gut bacteria. So it is made, but to a very, very small uh, extent, you need to have very good gut health for it. And what it does first, we can come to the thing later uh, about you know how to help us to improve our K2. But K2 is very important because it channelizes the calcium. So if I'm eating too much calcium, it may go to the wrong place. It may go to my eyes and cause cataract. It may go to my tendons and cause tendonitis. It may go to my knees and cause a kind of arthritis there. It may go to my kidneys and cause kidney stone. It worst thing is that it can go into my coronary arteries and cause calcification. Now we know more and more that cholesterol is not such a culprit. Biggest culprit is calcium in the arteries. And that ruptures and you have a heart attack. Buildup of calcium is very slow. By the time it builds up, I'm 90 years and gone. That's all right. Calcium just suddenly, because of high blood pressure, it ruptures. And that's where the heart attack comes suddenly out of the blue. Right? Wonderful. Wonderful. So very important. Very, very yeah. important to take V2, uh, K2, because K2 is taken with calcium and D3, because then it is going to channelize it into the right place, which is the bone. It will take it to the bone. Besides doing that, it also is known as an extractor. It takes out calcium from the wrong places and puts calcium into the right place, which is the bone. So that's why K2 is very important. And again, Dr. Dipti can talk about it, but uh, you get it from fermented food. Like the Japanese have very low incident of uh, low calcium, heart attacks, because they take their, one of the major dishes they take is natto. Natto is fermented soybean. Please read up the menu, how to do it, the ingredients and the way to make it. Is, uh, it's all given on the net. Natto is a wonderful number one high content uh, vitamin K2. Another is what uh, is the national um, food of, uh, the, of Germany, and that is sauerkrauts. Sauerkrauts is nothing but apple cider vinegar with or vinegar with cabbage, you know, done it and fermented over. So basically, right. so looking at the bacteria, you know, to the right bacteria to grow uh, in the gut. So people who have got IBS, you know, women, uh, they now they come out that women who have got IBS, who have got Crohn's disease, who have got um, you know major gut problem or on a lot of antacids or who are taking diuretics, they are going in for early menopause. Now this is very very new. There are studies on this. Uh, I, I was just talking to somebody in the U.S. and they were saying that you know most of the universities are doing studies on this. And why is that? That is again because of this gut problem and you're wiping away the good bacteria or people who are taking long-term antibiotics. So then when you knock this off, you're going to have a problem 
uh, you could have more complications of your menopause, which is bone health, which is so important for a woman. And that's going to go for a toss. Great, great. So to reiterate, uh, vitamin K2, the new vitamin that Dr. Bhatia has just spoken about, it's very important for the body to use the calcium and to help build our bones. And also it inhibits blood vessel calcification and prevents so many diseases. So it's found in fermented foods and also if you have to have great gut health. Thank you so much, Dr. Bhatia. And going forward, uh, so let's come to uh, the cardiovascular disease. And it is perhaps the single, single, I mean, largest cause of death in women responsible for almost one third of all female deaths every year. So uh, women, you know, often overlook it because it was thought uh, earlier or largely even now that it's a man's disease uh, till quite recently. So consequences of cardiovascular disease, they include heart attacks, they include strokes and related debility, and it's actually entirely preventable. So uh, Dr. Bhatia, why is this group more prone to heart attacks and strokes? And could you also tell us briefly about any tests uh, you would advise to proactively avoid these two dangerous complications? Yeah, so basically um, as estrogens decline, you must have seen one thing that we all are familiar with this, that women are protected, right? From heart attacks and strokes. And why are they protected? Because of estrogens? because they have very good HDL, the good cholesterol, and they have low LDL. Now, the moment they start the estrogens, they start declining. The next problem which arises is you'll find, or if they've had a surgery where the ovaries have been removed. So the next problem you'll find is that the HDL starts coming down, the good cholesterol, which is the sweeper, which actually cleans up the cholesterol and the LDL starts going up. So the risk becomes same for men and women, absolutely. But those people who have had early menopause, the risk becomes double. This they found. So they found out that the risk becomes double. And I think a lot to do, a lot to do is with, uh, again, like I said, with the hormonal changes, these people don't sleep very well. The stress hormones are released like cortisol and insulin and catecholamines. That is, you know, causes weight gain and weight gain causes insulin resistance. And with that, then again, as you know, uh, when you have central obesity, that itself becomes a very big risk factor for cardiac disease and for strokes. So I think, um, like what you're saying, just to summarize quickly, all investigations, I would tell women here, because it's what women's health today, take care of your hemoglobin, get that done, get your serum, iron and ferritin. Ferritin is more important because ferritin tells you the bone marrow stores more than the iron. So do that. Do your B12. The entire nervous system bathes in B12. Your energy levels are low because of low B12. So get your B12 done. <clears throat> Check your thyroid. Do a screening test like TSH, right? If you are having fragmented sleep or a lot of snoring, get a sleep study done, right? And your oxygen is falling. Get that done. Look at your alkaline phosphatase more than your calcium and your magnesium. If necessary, get your bone marrow thing. Uh, bone densitometry done, look at your lipid profile. We just talked about HDL and we look, talked about your um, uh, this thing. And if you are metabolic, in this, you have a metabolic problem like uh, sugar is borderline, you're pre-diabetic, then you should definitely also look at your triglycerides. Then there's, we look at homocysteine because in women, if the homocysteine is high, the blood is thick. And then there's a problem of clotting. So it's a good idea to look at that and uh, B1, B6, so these vitamins are all easily done. So there's a whole profile, which, you know, we made for, as you know, in VLCC, we have this uh, profile check. So it's very important to get the B1, B6, B12. Homocysteine is missed very often, which should not. And definitely, um, I'm not a very great fan of getting fasting insulin done because it has a short life. And Huma, so it's better to just do HPA1C. That will give us a good idea. And again, don't go by calcium magnesium, do an alphos and go by the sym symptomatology. That's more important. Wonderful, wonderful. I think that is really useful, Dr. Bhatia. Uh, I'm sure our attendees are benefiting so much about this. So, uh, yes, uh, recently we have started hearing about uh, another form of diabetes affecting women called the diabetes 3. So what exactly is this, Dr. Bhatia? So <clears throat> diabetes 3 is a very long drawn, uh, actually that it's a lot of, uh, not in textbooks, but I, I've got to give Dr. Sonia Malik time now. So I'll just say it in one line. Basically it is 
a kind of like remember like this pre diabetes so there is pre dementia so pre dementia in a way is called diabetes type 3 also now they started in encompassing the whole thing cognitive dysfunction pre dementia multi infarct dementia and alzheimers it all comes under three and it all comes under this and it's all because of insulin so insulin unlike in the periphery where you need sugar to go inside the cells to give energy uh, in the brain it's it's not it's not required but in, if there's too much insulin in the body it sweeps in through the blood brain barrier there into the brain and when it does it creates havoc so it creates havoc in many ways so which uh, this, something let's put it very simply the insulin signaling goes wrong i would love to talk about it is very interesting what it does in the brain uh, but i there's short of time so i will not get into medical jargon all i would say because the viewers would be wanting what is you know a large bit what what will you do for my mother who is got getting early memory loss in dementia stop her from having sweets bring the carbs <laughs> bring the carbs down the carbs the insulin comes out and is sweeping into the wrong areas insulin eyes also they do not require uh, insulin it's a spillover the kidneys also it's a spillover the the fat, the liver requires it by adipose tissue requires the insulin but not these three organs so these the kidney the eyes and the brain it's all fat metabolism they don't want ins- they don't want but insulin he creeps in you know he is he is the he is the fellow who walks <laughs> in uninvited and once he does does that uh, there is a lot of havoc so basically tell your moms and tell your grandmoms they they start and then actually the brain fog gets better with sweets so they take it but they don't realize from 8 early it will become 6 early you know i got a mother here who's 92 years old she's asking for chocolates every 3 hours now you know uh-huh. unfortunately this has just come up in the last few months uh, this thing that you have to totally crush the carbohydrates to the point that they will cry for it but you don't you give fat you have to increase good fats so good fats are like coconut you know virgin coconut oil they need to take that ghee is a good fat some animal fats are very good a lot of seeds dipti will talk about it a lot of seeds have very good fat in it so we need to give good fats because brain is all fat metabolism and you will you will find that you are arresting the disease uh, and that is a great thing because it's not will not progress and early dementia you can stop you see dementia for all of us sitting here is very worrying i don't mind dying tomorrow but i don't want to be dependent on anybody none of us want to be dependent on on anybody so dementia you become dependent and that's a very a no hospital wants you so that's something very sad. i think we should next time pick up dementia it's a very interesting topic and right. so, i think i've uh, spoken enough thank you <laughs> thank, you. thank you so much dr bhatia this was really very useful and uh, so now we know how to take care of our bone health our heart health about vitamin k2 which helps build up bone and also about diabetes 3 which may lead to early dementia or even uh, you know worsen the alzheimer's disease thank you so much dr bhatia wonderful so uh, now i'm uh, really very pleased to introduce our special guest dr sonia malley she is among the india's leading sci- scientific authorities on fertility and ivf and is director and head of department of nova south and fertility and ivf delhi ncr and uh, she has held positions of president indian menopause society president indian fertility society and lifetime chairperson of infertility committee uh, which is fogsi and uh, she is of course a recipient of the ima kanak goel award ima sda sdb meritorious service award ima lifetime achievement award and of course delhi government best doctor pn oh lifetime achievement award is and lifetime achievement award haryana gynian ops wonderful wow <laughs> welcome dr sonia malik it is such an honor to have you with us today thank you for joining us yes thank you so much for having me here i feel i mean it's such an honor to be amongst all of you it is indeed a great pleasure a great when dheeraj is a great, great friend so i would thank all of you for having me here at this platform this is such a prestigious platform so uh, and i feel 
uh, it's a very good opportunity to talk to women, you know. Yes. Therefore, <laughs> and you are the best person Thank for you. it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, Dr. Malik, uh, we have many girls who come to VLCC to lose weight, and most of them suffer from PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome. So, what, according to you, is the most worrisome hormonal imbalance? seen in young girls these days besides PCOS? Uh, well, that is indeed a very, very relevant question. And I think we need to spread more awareness about it because these young girls really do not know about it much. So uh, as you rightly said, most of the girls would be approaching you for PCOS. And you also know that there are very many varieties of PCOS. That means a, a girl may be obese, she may be thin, but she may be still a PCOS. And uh, more than that, she may be having irregular periods and be a PCOS, or she may be having regular periods and yet be a PCOS. So here on the other side of the spectrum, we have a woman or a girl who is also having irregular periods, but she is having a premature ovarian insufficiency. So that is the other hormonal problem, which is emerging now as one of the most worrisome and difficult problems to treat today in the country amongst all women. So, wow. uh, yeah, so that is something which is, I see PCOS is an, an endocrinal uh, disorder where we can somehow treat them. We have got to the, we've got the hang of it now, as I would say, as Deepak as Dheeraj has already told you about insulin metabolism. So basically this is just an offshoot of that, but this new, new emerging monster, I would say, is wow. something that we are still not got a hang of and we really do not understand why it is happening to our girls, but it is rampant. Okay. And about 25% of my practice <clears throat> is of premature ovarian insufficiency. Oh my that's goodness. A lot, that's a huge, huge number. Yeah. yeah. So like you said, these terms uh, used are premature ovarian aging or premature ovarian insufficiency. And even we call it as earlier, we used to call it as premature ovarian failure. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, we would like to know more about it, Dr. Malik. What does this mean? And is this uh, different from perimenopause or menopause? Well, yes. Uh, yes and no. Uh, the terms that you have used, insufficiency, and then it borders on to uh, a little bit of uh, failure and then complete ovarian failure. And of course, it, then it transits into menopause. So it's a kind of a transition for happening from uh, decreased ovarian function to total ovarian function being lost. You know, oh, that is what it means. And so when we, when the woman is actually having this kind of uh, swings, you would say, just as you have in perimenopause, you have these swings of up and down hormones. Similarly, in premature ovarian insufficiency also, the girl or the woman would have uh, hormones going up and down. And that is, you know, when the ovaries are suddenly trying to, you know, say goodbye to you. And then once the hormones are kind of, you know, really high and the ovary stops to respond, then that state is called ovarian failure. And there is very little difference between ovarian failure and menopause because basically ovarian failure means that the ovary stopped functioning and menopause also means that the ovary has stopped functioning. But in that transient period where there is a, where, like I said, there is swaying, where premature insufficiency is happening, that is the time where there is a difference between perimenopause and premature ovarian insufficiency, because here the, it can be reversed and completely it can just become normal absolutely without the patient, not even, without the patient even knowing that she had this problem and suddenly she becomes all right. So okay. that kind of a thing happens in premature insufficiency, but in true menopause or true perimenopause, it is not going to happen. It is going to be a steady decline and finally a menopause. So that is the difference oh, between the yeah. two. And, wonderful, wonderful. And if you talk of the age, if you're talking about the age, well, uh, according to the definition, if it is anything below the uh, usual age of menopause in the country, uh, say 2%, you know, basically they are, talking of percentiles, but let me talk in uh, actual terms. In India, the age of menopause, the average age of menopause is about 46, 47, against the age of menopause in the West where it is 52. So we are in any case uh, ahead of the West by about five, six years, 
we age earlier than them. And that is the reason, like Dr. Dheeraj was pointing out, we have more osteoporosis, we have more uh, you know, uh, cardiac disease in younger women. And similarly, carcinomas also, cancers also emerge in the younger age group because we are aging faster. And right. so even premature menopause would therefore mean anything below the age of 40 in the other group, that means the Caucasians 40, but in our case 36, because we are oh. aging faster. So you can imagine majority of our patients who are coming in that category are really, really young. And some of them, as you know, in urban India now, the age of marriage is also gone higher and women do not want to get married early, number one. If they are married, they don't want to produce children very early because they feel they don't want to have a child as yet. So all that is affecting the reproduction, all that is affecting the fertility. One end is the fertility and one end is their well-being. So therefore, this is something which really needs to be noticed Wonderful. and made aware of. Yeah. Wonderful. Yes, sure. So Dr. Milik, uh, what are the signs and symptoms that we should make us suspect this? And is it uh, there only in uh, married women or can unmarried young girls also have it? And how do you actually diagnose it? There are certain tests for it. And uh, we'd really like to know about this. This is very interesting. Dr. Anju, you're asking really nice, really good questions, really relevant ones, the ones which would interest the women who are attending this webinar today. Uh, you know, the, the problem is that it, is, it can affect younger women as well. I mean, it's not just the old women. In, in our own practice, we are seeing that uh, girls the age of 28, 29 are also coming with ovarian insufficiency and we start to, you know, try to make them pregnant and we find that they have no eggs left, you know. So it's, it's not affecting just the older women, even the younger ones, and again, the unmarried ones as well, not just the married ones. And therefore, you know, it is very important for the young girls now to look out for such symptoms. And what could be the symptoms? They may have nothing. They, it will, they may be caught totally unawares, number one, or they may be having irregular periods. Irregular periods, scanty periods, and some people would think that they are having PCOS. But it's not actually PCOS, it's actually premature ovarian failure. So, you know, even the doctors have come become aware of it very recently. Many of times we never even were looking at these things. And we were just thinking that this patient is just having irregular periods and nothing more than that. But their ovaries are telling us that actually their function is declining and we do need to take care of that. So therefore, if there is anything which is going wrong with the periods, it's becoming, you know, the interval is becoming longer. Instead of a period happening every month, it is coming every two months or it is coming every half, one and a half months and it is scanty also, even if it is not. So they must take care of that. Other than that, in premature ovarian failure, there is no other symptom, nothing else, just that. So therefore, okay. you have to keep a watch for that. And you ask me the tests. Now, yes. Any, any woman or any girl who is actually thinking of getting married, this is my suggestion to everybody today, that they must have a premarital counseling. They must go young girls of the age of above 25 should now make it a point to actually have one consultation with a gynecologist in order to know what her ovarian function is like. If her ovarian function is good, she doesn't have to worry for the next four or five years. But if it is borderline, she better be careful. There is something called fertility preservation. We shall talk about it a little later. But basically, one's consultation. And the tests, just a simple ultrasound to see what is the state of the ovaries, because you know that PCO is also diagnosed with ultrasound. So this is the other extreme. There you will find more than normal eggs. Here you will find hardly any eggs, number one. And number two is a test called AMH anti-mullerian hormone. This hormone is actually responsible for the formation of uh, an egg every month. And it also tells you how many are going to be recruited in the ovary every month. And out of that, one will become a big egg and the rest will become, will decline. So th that is the function of this. And if that hormone is very low, it means that the ovarian reserve is actually crashing. So you have to be careful about the AMH levels. And then there is another hormone called the FSH, which, is, which tends to be high because that is secreted by the brain. And it is the brain trying to tell the ovary to perform, but it is not, hence it is becoming higher. So a high FSH, a low AMH, and very few follicles or very few eggs in the ovary will tell you that this patient is actually not going to have a very good time ahead. And we must do everything, we must interfere immediately. That is what it warns us about. 
Wonderful. So just an ultrasound and just a hormonal blood test. SH and AMH can actually tell us uh, what is in store for the young girls, especially who are getting married. And it's a very good idea to take uh, one session with the gynecologist and that can make things so much simpler. And they can take, uh, uh, you know, quick, uh, you know, help if it is required. Yes, yes. That uh, time, yes. you know, we always talk of window of opportunity in medicine. There right. is always a window for everything, you know, and for every age. And so also for fertility and for, you know, reproduction, there is a window. And right. unfortunately for Indians, that window comes at a very young age. Probably that is that was the reason in olden, olden years, we used to marry our children, you know, very early. The girls used to get married. We used to be married off at younger age. We probably right. knew that the reproductive function is going to decline fast. So, yeah. <laughs> right absolutely right so doctor now suppose somebody has this now so there must be the treatment so and we keep hearing about this ovarian rejuvenation and uh, other things so i'm sure at vlcc you must be knowing ovarian rejuvenation <laughs> yeah well yes you see the thing is that first of all prevention i said you know uh, and basically the only way to prevent it is to know that it can happen and uh, if you have a history, if there is a history of premature menopause or early menopause in your mother or in your aunt or anybody in the family, it should be warning you that, you know, it can happen to you as well. Or if there is a sister who's gone in for an IVF or an infertility treatment and, and ended up with having donor eggs or something, it should warn you. And then there is a very important syndrome, very, very important congenital defect, which runs in sisters. And that is called the fragile X syndrome, which I must tell everybody about because basically it can be detected. And if it runs in the family, and unfortunately, if you have a child, it can lead to autism also in the child. So if you have such a family history, then definitely, definitely, like I suggested, you have to have a premarital counseling, you know, with a, with a gynecologist, not even premarital, just a counseling with any gynecologist to know whether you're normal or not. And of course, uh, the other very important reason for premature ovarian insufficiency in the country is tuberculosis of the ovaries and uterus, genital tuberculosis. That is a rampant cause of infertility and premature ovarian insufficiency in the country. So if there is any family history of tuberculosis of the chest in anybody, or she herself has had it, then she better be careful about her ovarian reserve also. So these are some things that you need to be careful about. And once you've done that, then uh, prevention, like I said, is if you have a borderline ovarian reserve, then uh, the best thing is to do a fertility preservation, which means that at a younger age, say 25, 29, 30 years, not beyond that, because you won't get good eggs and the quantity of eggs would also decrease, but 30, 30, maximally 32, you should try to contact somebody who's doing an IVF clinic or a person who is doing uh, oocyte preservation. So what is, what, what is done is that the eggs from the body of the girl are removed and then they are frozen. And then they can be used whenever she's ready to use them when she finds a partner or she's otherwise wanting a child even single women can have ch children now so anybody who wants to have a child later on can use them and about oocyte activation about uh, uh, rejuvenation of the ovary there are various methods which are being uh, uh, now coming up they are not absolutely evidence-based i wouldn't say that they are established methods but they are very promising and one of them is the use of PRP, which many of you would have heard is being used a lot by the hair clinics to grow hair and, at, and also by the orthopedic surgeons for joints, for uh, osteoarthritis. So they, the same thing is being used also and injected into the ovaries to help in the reformation of eggs inside the ovaries. And once the eggs form, the hormones also form and therefore everything returns to normal. That is one thing. And with PRP also, the other thing which is being used is stem cells. So again, the stem cells are also taken from the girl's body. It's from, the, from one of your bones. It's not coming from anyone else. It's not like a donor. It's a self thing. And then you take it and, and that it is churned and prepared and the stem cells are separated out and then put back into your own uterus and ovaries to rejuvenate them. So these are some of the popular methods which are being used. And there is one very fascinating method, which I must mention because it's, it fascinates me as well, but it's very, very new. And that is that you remove a part of the ovary by laparoscopy, 
activate it outside in the laboratory and then put it back into the woman's body again and sew it up over there in the woman's body close to the uterus and it starts functioning again. So this method is actually being used by menopausal women to postpone their menopause. So basically you, post, you take out the ovary, take out bits of the ovary when you're young and put them back when you're older. So you're reversing your menopause, you start ovulating, you start menstruating, and there have been one or two pregnancies reported in the world, but they did not carry on. There's no live birth with this method, but yes, it seems to be a very promising method, especially wow. <laughs> for women who have menopause early. So this is what world is coming to, a lot of experimentation, yes. Wonderful. Who would have thought some few years back that you could freeze your, you know, egg outside and get it back later and have baby later and uh, you could do, you know, regulation of ovaries with uh, PRP, PRP is platelet-rich plasma, which is yes, your own blood. Uh, it is uh, centrifuged and you get the, uh, you know, plasma, which is rich in platelets and uh, the growth factors, which help in the regulation of the ovaries. And, uh, you know, that's one system. And like Dr. Malik said, you could even, uh, you know, uh, do stem cells, which can be taken out from your bone. And uh, what more can be happening? You are taking out part of ovary outside and uh, loving it. keeping it for later use. Wonderful. It's such a fascinating thing to hear about all this. So, uh, Dr. Malik, now uh, so much we have learned from you. And uh, the thing is that now for the minimum menopausal ladies, you know, who are also suffering uh, in the perimenopausal stage, uh, the symptoms like they are unique, some have severe, some have mild, but those who have severe symptoms like hot flushes, night sweats, anxiety, depression, unable to sleep, UTI, etc. So uh, how do you manage uh, these severe symptoms for them? First of all, uh, let me tell you that we have, uh, you are actually talking about the person who's actually having bad menopausal symptoms. Right, absolutely. So, yeah, so basically, uh, there is nothing better than hormone therapy for them. And we know that hormone therapy has had a backlash. It has been, you know, people are talking about it, saying that it causes a lot of problem, majorly breast cancer. And of course, uh, a cancer of the uterus as well, and then cardiac disease. Uh, but what is, what is more important is when do you give it? How do you give it? And how long do you give it? That is more important than, you know, just randomly prescribing hormone. So we also knew, for example, let me take the example of steroids. We have known all these years that steroids are bad and we don't want, and we've always suspected even the Ayurvedas and homopaths that they add steroid to it and then there is well-being and what all. But COVID has taught us that steroids are so essential, you know, and they are required to save our lives. Similarly, hormone therapy for a patient who is suffering from severe symptoms are like steroids. They are essential and they have to be given to her because otherwise the quality of life of this woman is miserable. She cannot sleep, she cannot function. And as you know, you know, women in the perimenopausal and menopausal age are the ones who are, are in senior positions as executives. They are senior positions in various uh, walks of life. And for them not to function because they are having very bad menopausal symptoms in the middle of a meeting, she suddenly breaks into a sweat. That's very embarrassing. So for them, it becomes very essential to prescribe menopause, uh, this hormone therapy. And uh, I would say that we should not be scared of prescribing it. We should not be scared. The only thing is to actually, uh, first of all, do a proper testing of the patient, whether she can take it or not, and whether it is really indicated and she has no other problems with her, that, which are contraindicated. And the second thing is whether she, she uh, is going to listen to you completely. I'll give you an example. Suppose there is a woman coming from the village. She also is very high. She also needs it. But you know that she's not going to come for a follow-up. It is going to be very difficult to prescribe hormone therapy for this woman. Okay. So therefore, type of patient, the kind of uh, you know, social strata she comes from, and the kind of patient who is going to listen to the doctor. So those are important. And then of course, you can go ahead and prescribe hormones to them. That is the best method. 
if the patient is not willing to take hormones and if the patient has a contraindication to this, then there are other things like herbs, and uh, other uh, vit pro vitamins, vitamins. Some of them, Dr. Dheeraj has already mentioned. You know, even these, even calcium, magnesium, and this K two. All these are actually going to help her to tide through her menopause. Uh, these symptoms as well. And then you have the as the some of these uh, drugs which are elevating her mood. So anti anxiety. These can be given to her so that she feels a more a little more rested. But of course, you know, majority of the patients I would advise today through this forum, please do not feel scared of taking hormone therapy if you have an indication and if you want to. It should be started when she just, just is hitting menopause as early as possible and she's having these bad symptoms, number one, in the lowest possible dose, not in high doses. And secondly, it should not be taken for more than five years at all, not at all. Better would be two, three years, but if she wants to extend it, five years. So, of course, with the recommendation of a gynecologist or a doctor like Dr. Dheeraj Bhatia, who knows a lot about it. <laughs> okay, so for, yeah. Yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Yes, so we ladies should not be scared of uh, hormonal treatment. If it is symptoms are bad, we can take it. But like Dr. Malik said, it has to be taken quickly, early in the early menopause stage. If it becomes late, then it may cause harm rather than help. And uh, we can take it for three, four, maximum up to five years. And of course, we need to check for all the contraindications and that our doctors will really help us do that. Strictly supervised, strictly yeah. supervised by the doctor. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Malik. But there is a question coming again and again from our attendees and they want to know that uh, what screening uh, ladies uh, should opt for? What would you recommend for women? What are the screening tests we should be doing and at what stage? Uh, that's such an important uh, thing very, for everybody. Very, very, actually very important. We were talking about a patient who has symptoms and you know she is coming to you for the symptoms, but there are menopausal women who do not have any problem and they just are menopausal. So screening is something which has to be done for every woman. It's not just for the person who has symptoms, but any person who is in that age group must go through screening because this is going to help her, you know, detect, we, it is going to help us detect any problem that she may be having and she's not aware of it. So first of all, it should start at age 40 because basically, like I said, 40, Seven is the age of menopause in this country. And unfortunately, all our problems are beginning a little earlier than that, and especially breast cancer. Breast cancer in this country is arising even at as early as in late 20s, but 40 to 60 is the average age of breast cancer in this country. Hence, the screening for breast cancer should begin at 40. Perhaps, uh, sorry, the mammograms, first of all, of course, self-examination every month, then doctor's examination every year, and a mammogram every, every three years should be done after age 40. And then when she becomes 50, the mammogram should, the, the, uh, the frequency should increase. That means every two year or maybe one year. Pap smear every year, a clinical examination every year, uh, an ultrasound, which of course many societies do not talk about, but it was not a bad idea to get an ultrasound also done because it test, tells you about the ovarian status. That whether there is any growth or anything in the ovary, but it is not mentioned in many of the screening programs. And the rest of it is just as Dr. Bhatia said, the screening for heart disease and for the bone and for lipid profile, all that, and of course, majorly diabetes, all that has to be done. So in any well woman check, you know, that is what we call it, isn't it? So any well woman check has to be, has to include breast examination as well as, you know, the cervix, uterus and cervix, that's it. Wonderful. So uh, just to reiterate, uh, we women should not hesitate to do ourselves our breast examination. It has certain steps, the way we need to do sitting, standing, lying down. All these are given. Uh, you can just check it out in the net. There are various sites with pictures and videos. And one must should do, one must do that. And if there is any hesitation, you may ask your doctor and gynecologist to show you how to do that because that is the, the that catches the 
answer initially and once we have that uh, diagnosis it can be life saving also like dr malik said we should go for mammogram we should go for pap smear we should go for ultrasound and these are the basic tests like they are there for all uh, executive checkups that we have for women in all the hospitals and all the clinics and one must just go for it and should not miss it uh, because they are so important so thank you so much dr malik for sharing your experience and invaluable advice our attendees and we too have benefited so much uh, with better understanding of so many changes that we as women experience as we age and uh, we know thank that you so this better understanding will remove many misconceptions and anxieties amongst our attendees and women folk and thank you so much for your time thank you so thank you so much thank you so much once again for having me it was very yeah. interesting thank you thank you thank you're you. a wonderful host thank you thank you so uh, the next is uh, you know diet exercise de-stressing and other healthy lifestyle measures also have a very significant effect on one's well-being so let's see how diet impacts us through our life as ladies as we age so i am now very pleased to introduce our next panelist dr deepthi verma who with over 25 years in the field of nutrition and dietetics currently heads nutrition at vlcc skill development and she has been a lecturer a medical nutrition consultant a writer and an editor and she has been felicitated with several awards for her contribution to nutrition including a lifetime achievement award in september 2019 though she is a very young girl <laughs> so welcome to the webinar dr deepthi and uh, it's a pleasure having you always thank you so much uh, dr anjigai it is such a pleasure being here and hearing from dr dheeraj bhatia and dr sonia malik it is an absolute pleasure being on this same platform as them so thank you so much thank you so let's uh, get to the question that we are getting from our attendees and uh, of course it's uh, it's uh, the first one which is which says what diet and lifestyle choices would you recommend for a menopausal women are there any foods like uh, special foods like estrogenic foods and how do they help yeah so as you know dr bhai like at vlcc we have had several clients coming to us with menstrual irregularities and infertility issues and obesity management and we've been able to reverse them with diet and lifestyle choices so yeah that has a huge impact definitely on fertility issues for sure and uh, you know estrogen definitely is a hormone that actually uh, you know takes care of reproductive and the sexual health in females uh, but it's also very very protective in terms of um, you know like it does take it does have an impact on the blood vessels cardiovascular health insulin sensitivity uh, the obeso cognitive health uh, you know like and several and of course the bone health as uh, dr bhatia and dr malik has already spoken about so definitely you know there are certain foods when when estrogen actually starts going down during the menopause so yes definitely there are certain foods that help take care of alleviating these symptoms like hot flushes and mood swings and depression and the deteriorating bone health so there are these are called phytoestrogens which are present in plant based diets and they are definitely like the soya bean that heads the list and also the garlic but the garlic taken in the raw forms it can be taken in the form of dips or chutneys or the garlic pickle or the crushed garlic with green chilies that way but yeah i mean it has to be taken in the rawish form and then of course the flax seeds so flax seeds are wonderful uh, estrogenic foods and other than giving estrogen of phytoestrogen they would also be giving the other nutrients like omega 3 uh, which is very important during menopause so yeah i mean like then broccoli um uh, whole grain cereals are very good estrogenic foods and especially oats you know so an oatmeal would actually serve also it would give us beta glucan uh, along with um, you know the phytoestrogen so these are primarily the food and they are all mostly plant based diets and not the animal sources of the foods uh, so these are the foods actually that behave like phytoestrogen but more important than you know like then taking these foods also eliminating all the processed foods from the diet you know because these days so menopause has always been there you know for every female 
I mean, it's been there in our parents and grandparents and generations behind and all the women generations behind have, have gone through a menopause, but it was never so much talk of the town as it is today. And that's only because of the huge dietary and lifestyle changes that has come around and people eating a lot of processed foods, not working out as much as they should be. Of course, that you are going to be talking about, you know, and I'm very keen to actually listen to that. And uh, other than that, you know, like uh, there's so much of stress that people have these days. And, uh, you know, of course, like when one works out, there also releases a lot of happy hormones. So that takes care of the mental health at the same time. And then, of course, simple carbohydrates is something we need to kind of really control because the carbohydrate metabolism actually goes in for a toss during menopause. So simple carbohydrates and white sugar creates a havoc when it is constantly being consumed on a daily basis. So switching over to the complex carbohydrate. So for any nutrition consultant, you know, for us, glucose, which is required in the body means cereals. It does not mean sugar. So every cereal that we consume, whether it is oats or a wheat chapati or ragi or bajra or juar or any kind of millets, after the process of digestion, it all converts into glucose, which is the end product of the digestion. So for us, for any nutrition consultant, that's glucose for us. It's not really eating sugar and it's not really eating maida, biscuits and pastas and all the other refined flour products and cookies and rusk that people have so much. Carbonated beverages are total no because they are so rich in phosphoric acid and that's an acid. A human body is always alkaline. So that phosphoric acid, which is present in the sodas and carbonated beverages, that actually creates a havoc, not just in the body during menopause, but also a lot of pressure on the kidneys because, you know, kidneys, kidney function gets compromised, you know, when one constantly keeps having, you know, a lot of processed food and kidneys are not able to filter phosphorus. So again, that acid buildup starts happening in the body, which further deteriorates and the, you know, health goes in concentric circles. So yes, processed foods are a total no. Now, caffeine and alcohol, two things again are not that great during menopause at all. Caffeine actually increases the symptoms of the menopause, especially hot flashes and depressive symptoms and the bone health further going down. So caffeine is a total no. Now people say that, you know, we have green tea and that's like really nice. And whenever we've had anything extra, people want to have, they, they eat chole patur and they want to have a green tea in, in order to wash that out. But guys, that doesn't work. And uh, even if it is green tea, it contains about 30 to 50 milligrams of uh, caffeine. And the tea, of course, the normal in chai, which is well brewed, contains a lot of caffeine in it. All right. I mean, we brew it on its own. We ex extract caffeine into it. And then, of course, coffee would have caffeine as well. So cutting down on the caffeine is very, very important, especially during menopause. And um, alcohol and smoking is something. Alcohol needs to be limited. Alcohol has to go down. And if we can eliminate uh, smoking, absolutely would be great. And it would definitely alleviate the uh, menopausal symptoms. So these are little tips. And of course, like Dr. Bhatia had spoken about the magnesium. Yes, it is so important to have magnesium. And it has not been really one single mineral that we've not been talking about off plate. But it is very, very crucial to any woman's health for that matter, you know, in perimenopausal and menopausal age. So as I've always said in all my other live shows as well, that please eat two bananas on a daily basis. They are really good in uh, magnesium. Other than that, as Dr. Bhatia mentioned, the green leafy vegetables. So we have so much here in India. I mean, like amaranth and spinach, and they're really, really good in magnesium. And of course, one handful of nuts and seeds, because that will take care of the magnesium plus omega-3. And omega-3 is also very important. So, you know, especially for the brain health and even for oxygen uptake by all our cells of the body head to toe. So, yeah, these are the foods that especially need to be taken care of. Wonderful, wonderful. That was so nicely put and so elaborately done. And so uh, very correctly, you said that we need to take care of our uh, diet and especially go for alkaline food because our body is alkaline. And if, if, if we have acidic food, like, like you said, if we have cold drinks or sodas, which have phosphoric acid, it makes our body uh, body's pH uh, acidic and what happens is body tries to compensate and it leaches out calcium from your bone 
to make your body alkaline and that makes your bones even worse you know already in menopause you have osteopenia and osteoporosis and when you have acidic food then the body reaches out more calcium and like uh, uh, like deepthi dr deepthi said uh, it also affects the kidneys so go for the foods that she has mentioned and you will be good to go yes uh, dr deepthi there is a uh, you know uh, there is a very interesting question and uh, it, the the lady is asking everyone says during pregnancy eat for two how far is this true oh god yes i haven't heard that before so everybody is like you know so we are like the, the typical indian society whenever a girl gets pregnant she is expected to eat a lot she is expected to drink ghee along with milk she is expected to have laddus and things which are very very high calorie uh, because you know assumably that the baby is going to become very healthy but actually it becomes the other way around and uh, on an average a female should not gain more than about 11 to 12 kilos during pregnancy in all the three trimesters put together and uh, the diet that she, i mean when we talk about the calories uh you know in the first and second trimester it doesn't go above 350 additional calories over and above what she is supposed to be having and what she's been having before uh, conceiving and in the third trimester it would be somewhere around 500 to 550 kilo calories in addition to what she's been consuming you know and protein requirement also just goes down by 15 to 20 grams it is not much so which is just equivalent to drinking two cups of milk or taking say cheese Uh, the cottage cheese that i'm talking about not the processed one so that and some fruits additionally over and above what she's been taking before yeah it is very important that during pregnancy you know one should consult a dietitian if there is any glitch in terms of a hemoglobin or any help you can connect to our nearest vlcc centers uh, with it our dietitian is going to help you with it because it's very important to take care of the diet during pregnancy and people have always neglected this one aspect i mean people do come to us for obesity management or during pcos or hypothyroidism etc but during pregnancy they are just eating you know that further complicates the problems and these days there's so much talk about gestational diabetes are actually you know women in the third trimester in fact from second trimester onwards they start having and sometimes it does not go after the delivery so yeah i mean like so it's very important to be on a good nice healthy diet during pregnancy to consume all healthy carbohydrate that is complex carbohydrate a lot of greens because greens would contain calcium magnesium and of course iron and uh, other than that you know a handful of nuts and seeds which are very important pulses and legumes the plant based proteins is something that we would any time recommend during the pregnancy and a good lifestyle and uh, you know walks a good sleep cycle very very important whether it is menopause or whether it is pregnancy is very important because the sleep cycle or the circadian rhythm actually controls a lot of metabolic functions in the body yeah yeah thank you thank you so much dr deepthi because you know food is always of special interest because it's always in our control and uh, wise choices can have such significant impact on our health and well being so thank you so much once again thank you um, thank you always a pleasure thank you thank you so now you know now let's turn to exercise and how it helps us so you know uh, women's uh, risk for numerous medical conditions including uh, breast cancer type 2 diabetes heart diseases as you heard uh, all along uh, has it rises during and after menopause and something as simple as working out and exercising regularly and maintaining a healthy weight can help reduce these risks so above all you know working out will make you feel good haven't you noticed that when you exercise you suddenly feel a uh, high uh, feeling of you know feeling good and that is because of rush of feel good chemicals endorphins and serotonin and which are an added bonus so this can be especially very very important especially important for uh, the woman who is going through changes and is feeling uncon Un- uncomfortable during the menopausal stage and sometimes it's very painful so it really helps so let's see um, what kind of activity uh, 
would be beneficial. And uh, of course, uh, uh, before going to the different kinds of activities, like we heard uh, uh, Dr. Bhatia and Dr. Malik saying that ladies with menopause have uh, urinary incontinence, which is so embarrassing. Uh, and it happens uh, when they do suffer from a lot of UTI also. So one can just do a very simple exercise, which is called the Kegels exercise. And that is you know, uh, squeezing your pelvic muscle as if uh, uh, what it's like holding your bladder when you want to go to the loo. And you can do this any time during the day, number of times, and this is going to contract and relax your pelvic muscles, strengthen them, and will reduce uh, your uh, problem of urinary incontinence. Uh, so that was very important. And of course, uh, uh, we, we need to do aerobic activity that makes our large muscle groups and keeps our heart rate high and uh, gives us fat loss, et cetera, just, just 60 minutes of low to moderate intensity aerobic exercise, also called the cardio exercise on most days of the week should be your aim. Now this 60 minutes, you'll say, oh God, 60 minutes is too much. I don't have time. So you can actually break it up uh, into number of small sections. So three uh, 20 minutes uh, sessions or 30 minutes sessions to 30 minutes session over the whole day. And uh, so, so that will give you the benefit and your options for cardio or aerobic exercises are so many, you know, almost any activity counts, for example, brisk walking, swimming, slow jog, cycling, treadmill, cross trainer, stationary bike, even dancing, you know, if you like dancing, just go for it and sports, etc. So you have so many options, just pick up your mind and start doing it, start slow. And uh, of course, you must always begin with a warm up before doing any aerobic activity and allow a few minutes to cool down afterwards as well. Listen to your body. So whenever you feel your heart racing or you find yourself getting too tired, you are feeling dizzy, etc. Just, just stop uh, immediately and take rest and get medical help. Most important is, you know, avoid being sedentary, taking breaks from sitting, move and walk as much as possible throughout the day, because being sedentary and sitting too much is linked to increased risk of obesity, heart disease, diabetes, some types of cancers also. So get, uh, never lose an opportunity to get up and walk wherever you can. And of course, very, very, very important is the strength training, which we always don't do we are just doing walk or uh, going to the gym doing treadmill etc and for going strength training which is very important during this time of menopause and perimenopause because uh, it's very important because the risk of osteoporosis skyrockets following menopause because estrogen is needed to help lay down bone so strength training exercise help to build bone and muscle strength, burn body fat and improve your metabolism. And don't worry women, uh, uh, women doing strength training don't become manly and uh, build bulging muscles like men do. That's the fear we ladies have always. And we'll never have those bulky muscles because of our hormones. Our hormones are there to uh, make us just nicely toned and uh, having good muscle strength if you do strength training. So how do you build strength uh, training? Uh, you can opt at home uh, with dumbbells. You can have resistance tubing. You can go to the gym, have weight machines or free weights. Select a level that is heavy enough just to tax your muscles and start with 12 repetitions and you can progress from there. So alternatively, if you don't like to do exercises with weights, you can use your own body weight as resistance and do crunches, lunges, squats, planks, arm and leg strengthening exercises, Yoga and Tai Chi also, uh, though they are gentle, they fall in this group. So uh, the thing is to start slow and gradually progress. So finally, it's also uh, very, very important uh, to learn how to relax. 
and simple techniques help. Practice a relaxation technique that works for you, deep breathing or yoga or meditation. And there's something called as Jacobson's relaxation technique, which you can look into. Uh, it's not necessary to do all these if you don't like it. You may also like to relax with listening to music or gardening or pursuing any of your hobbies. So do and use whatever works for you. And remember that movement, moving can contribute to your physical and mental health. So don't be sedentary. Everything takes a little effort to begin with, but it's never too late to take care of yourself. Yes, so that was all about exercising. So let's see if there are any more questions from our attendees addressed to our panel. Uh, Dr. Bhatia, do we have any questions, please? Oh, I think um, Nikita Purit is asking that uh, with, with very bad mood swings, what should be done? But then Dr. Sonia Malik answered that. She said that in case it's bad, you should go for HRT. The earlier you go, the better. Uh, I think low-dose HRT is safe, provided there's no family history of cancer. That's one. You want to be very sure, get it ultrasound of the breast. For all the young women sitting here, ultrasound is safer less than 40 years. You remember, Dr. Sonia Malik was very, very specific on this. She said after 40 mammograms, right? So less than that. And if you, there is no, I think if there is nothing like... Um, you know, for bad mood swings or bad menopausal symptoms, if there's no family history, you've got a, you know, your, your ultrasound or, or your uh, mammogram is clear, uh, there's no reason why you should not meet somebody like Dr. Sonia Malik and start straight away, uh, start HRT. But you need it to do under guidance. I would strongly recommend don't try it yourself by reading Dr. Google, that, that which we all have a tendency to do. Uh, <laughs> I would suggest meet your doctor or meet her because she's a specialist and easily available in Delhi. Um, also, um, yeah, the other thing is, you know, if the mood changes, like, um, if you can't, then of course you need to take, uh, you know, some mood elevator and you can't sleep, but sleep very, very simple. Again, magnesium is very, very important. Don't take, uh, sedatives, not a good idea. And, you know, like, I think we were just talking the other day, Dr. Malik and me and Ashwagandha is very good. One tablet, Himalayan drug company, normally I don't like to take uh, company names, but anyway, Ashwagandha is it's a, it's a very good brand and you can take not one, take two, take two um, and one hour before sleeping, take it with magnesium and uh, otherwise if that doesn't work, then of course melatonin is there, a very, very small dose for a while and then you can stop it. But that works and you know, some deep breathing, some pranayam, some om chanting, all that really goes a long way. So it will help your mood swings quite a bit. But the earlier you start, as Dr. Malik said, the better, better you're going to you're going to have results. Thank, Any you, other questions? thank you so much. Malik is uh, here. Uh, sorry, Doctor um, Malik is here. Doctor Sonia ji is here. Any questions for her, Anju? Uh, I was just saying. In fact, most of the people are so happy with the, all the things that uh, Doctor Malik has mentioned that uh, there's just uh, they're all praise <laughs> messages. Uh, Doctor, a lot of praises. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Sonia Malik, they love your smile. They're, they're all like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Somebody is saying, I love uh, Dr. Malik's smile. Oh my God. Say that to her. <laughs> yeah, they're saying, uh, is it right to give contraceptives to PCOS patients? Ye Lata Gupta ka hai, on continuous basis, like for 10 years. <laughs> uh, ten years is a long time, and uh, you know we Indians have a tendency to have a trait of thrombosis. Also, yes. you know, Doctor Dheeraj would agree with me that we do have these uh, some of these factors in us which can lead to thrombosis. And PCO patients have also been seen to be having that. We have papers from India saying so. So you, you know, it is better to take it interruptedly, not on a continuous basis. Take it interruptedly for say six months and then give it a break and then take it again for a couple of months because at the end of it, why are you taking hormones? Either it is for your hirsutism, for your hair growth, or it is for irregular periods. These are the only two indications that are actually making you take it. So uh, for that, basically you can, for the hirsutism, you can depend on other things as well, you know, other medication as well as VLCC. And of course, for the irregular periods, you don't need to have more than four or five periods a year. 
you know, because basically what we are worried about is that the lining of the uterus should not become so thick that it leads to cancer in the uterus. That is what Absolutely. our worry is. So therefore, the periods can come every two months. It doesn't matter. Hence, there is no problem in breaking the hormone, uh, the OCPs, the oral contraceptive pills, and then taking them again, not on a continuous basis, like you said, for 10 years. Absolutely. I think uh, the, there are no more questions and everybody has been just so happy to listen to all the experts, especially Dr. Malik here. Mm-hmm. And so much. And in the end, I would just say that most of the diseases that affect uh, us women are treatable. And if they are detected early and women can live long and happy lives by following simple health, health tips, you know. So just remember, eat a healthy diet, maintain a healthy weight, get enough physical activity, don't smoke, limit alcohol use and uh, ensure proper regular medical screenings, avoid stress, practice stress relief techniques, and uh, most of all, build and enjoy loving, supportive relationships. They really help. Seek professional help when you need to, don't wait as best as you can Fill your life with friendship, family, pets, laughter and love and real relationships are the best support for lifelong healthy, uh, lifelong healthy life. And finally, keep smiling, uh, feel good about yourself and you are very, very special. So at VLCC, uh, our focus is on combined benefit of managing diet, activity, and lifestyle to keep our clients healthy and well for life. And that's why our teams of doctors, physiotherapists, nutritionists, and therapists, and wellness counselors, we all work together on custom design regime for each client to help them achieve their wellness goals. And it's not just about weight loss or centimeter loss. So thank you all for attending our webinar and guiding our conversations with your wonderful questions. And thanks also to our wonderful panelists, Dr. Sonia Malik, Dr. Bhatia, Dr. Deepti, for all your learning today, uh, learnings today. And uh, we hope uh, you have better understanding of your health for yourself or someone you may uh, know. And if you wish to know more, there is VLCC Center near you, where our team of experts are just waiting for you. So wish you all a healthy life filled with happiness and fulfillment and good evening and have a wonderful day. Thank you once again. Thank you all. Thank Thank you. Thank you.